Holy smokes! We are now at episode 25 in six short months. And we've recently topped 5,000 downloads. So thank you to our valued listeners. Your time I appreciate, and I will continue to crank out the best content consistently to keep you happy and scared. Also, some cool news. We have now made our Afraid of Nothing documentary available on Vimeo On Demand. So if you don't have Amazon Prime, where you can currently watch it, you can go to Vimeo On Demand by clicking the link in the show notes. We're offering a special discount for those who download the film and rent it, plus two free bonus videos and a three-day rental. How cool is that? Speaking of cool... This episode is one of the most unique ones you're going to hear. We have Rob Guttro, a pet medium, telling us how our pets who have gone to the afterlife are communicating with us. And we have one of my friends who recently lost a pet getting a reading from Rob. Here we go. In a world where nothing is known. Nothing is certain. Reality is not real. Wake up! Be afraid of nothing. I'm Bob Heskey. Robert. The host with the ghost. This is my podcast, based on my paranormal documentary, Afraid of Nothing. Each episode, we talk to people who see life and the afterlife through a different lens. Join me. Who is this large man? And what's he doing in our bedroom? As we lift the veil and open our minds to see beyond our eyes lie. This is Afraid of Nothing. So today's show is going to be something totally different. We have interviewed people on remote viewing, empaths, passionate clairvoyance, just the whole realm. But one thing we haven't talked to is a pet psychic. So we are very fortunate to have Rob Guttro on the call today. And Rob, though he can do many things, he's a medium, he's a paranormal investigator, he's an author, he does have his specialty as a pet psychic, and he's written a couple books about it. So we're going to talk to Rob about that today. Rob, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Excellent. You know, we both have a mutual acquaintance. You're, you're actually one of your really good friends is a uh, medium called Ruthie Larkin. And Ruthie was in my documentary, Afraid of Nothing. She speaks so highly of you. So when I connected with her recently, and we're going to have her on actually the next show after this one, she mentioned that I should connect with you. And I was like, oh, yeah, I definitely have to. So would you mind giving our audience, you know, a quick tease about Ruthie Larkin and how you got to know her and kind of how she's so awesome and what she does? Sure. Uh, So Ruthie and I are like brother and sister. We met quite a few years ago through a mutual friend of ours. Ruthie read my first book called Ghosts and Spirits, and she was fascinated by it because she has a gift. She has a tremendous gift. Actually, her gift is much more intense and developed than mine. So she came down and visited me and my husband with my book, and she had <laughs> she sat down with me for hours, and she had highlighted many pages, and we sat down for hours. She was asking me questions, and I was answering questions. We were talking back and forth. We uh, so we developed a mutual respect for each other and uh, and a love. I really love her like a sister. She is also a medical intuitive, which means she can diagnose what's going on with you. Um, she is also a psychic, which means that she can she can tune into the energies of past, present, and future. I don't have that ability. I'm just a medium. I just talk to dead people and dead pets. But uh, she has a tremendous gift. If you want the most detailed readings you can ever get in your life, Ruthie is definitely the person to go to. And she's known as the Beantown Medium. 
Yes, exactly. And by the way, if you want to get a reading with her, get at the end of the line because she's very popular, though she doesn't really publicize herself. In fact, she usually doesn't do shows like like this one, but uh, very fortunate that, that she offered to be on it. And I'll mention one other thing about Ruthie is she, her specialty is she is very good with parents who have lost a child, grieving parents, and she kind of has a specialty. She's got a very soft spot in her heart for that, and she does a lot of work helping people, and she does tend to push them to the front of the line. So really nice person. She, Yeah, she does. Um, and uh, so Ruthie is also featured in two of the books that I've written. One is Lessons Learned from Talking to the Dead, uh, where we both ran into the ghost of John Wilkes Booth in the Ford's Theater. <laughs> And wow. <laughs> yeah, and the, the other one is Pets in the Afterlife, where she has a whole chapter of how her dog Boston had come back and given her many messages and many signs. Wow, that is excellent. So while you look, we're, we're I'm all for plugs. So let's start right now. Let's let's tell people because you've written actually, is it seven or eight books so far? I've written seven. I'm writing my eighth, which is Pets in the Afterlife three. That's in progress wow. right now. Could you just give us quickly your your website where they could go to uh, one just your website and also where they could could check out the book so they'll and we'll bring it up at the end too but just would might as well if some people have interest why wait till the end sure the easiest one is petspirits.com or Rob Gutro G U T R O dot com but Pet Spirits will get you to my my website and everything's on Amazon they're in paperback and ebook and they're all under ten dollars because I am self published and I want to educate people and comfort people. So I set the lowest price I can on these books. Well, that's excellent. And one thing we should let the audience know is your day job, you're a meteorologist. So there's this science side of you that to go along with the paranormal side. And that must have been tough. How do you reconcile the science part of your brain with the paranormal spiritual side? Well, it, that's a really good question. And the answer to that is it's all about energy. All of the books that I've written are in the foundation of energy. So I think energy explains the paranormal because there's a law called the law of conservation of energy that says that energy can't be destroyed, only transformed. So what happens after we die is the energy within us couples with our memories, personality, and our knowledge. And that is what we call a soul, pretty much. And every living thing has a soul, animal or person. And we make a conscious choice either to stay here, which I call a ghost, earthbound, at a fixed location of our choosing. Or we cross over and join the energies of the cosmos or heaven or the other side, whatever you want to call it. And that's a spirit. So a ghost is earthbound and a spirit has crossed over. And there really is a difference because ghosts can only communicate in the fixed location of their choosing. Spirits can communicate with us anywhere in the world at any time. Since it's energy, how do they get their energy, ghosts and spirits? Do they get it the same way or, you know, we have food here on Earth. How do they energize themselves and, and reboot and communicate? There's a difference between the two of them, and there's also a similarity. So the similarity is they all draw on the physical energies of heat, light, water, and electricity. Those things power them up. For instance, that's why if you are in the presence of either one of them, they can manipulate the electricity in your house. They can make the electricity go on and off. They can make a, a TV go on. They can make a radio go on. So those things power them. That's, they take power from those things. But they also take power from emotional energy. And there's the difference. Earthbound ghosts use negative emotional energies, which are fear, anxiety, depression, and anger. So those things fuel a ghost, give them strength to get, get power enough to communicate. So if you go into a house that you think is haunted, perhaps, and you're feeling anxiety and nervousness and even fear, you are plugging in that ghost to get strong enough to communicate with you. Spirits, on the other hand, like like your grandma, who, uh, who may have passed, they rely on love and faith and hope, positive emotional energies. That brings them back. So if I'm feeling during the day, for some reason, I have a wave of being negative or angry. Mm -hmm. Could that could that be a ghost or an entity that's attached to me? Or is, you know, or is it something that's just my problem? <laughs> it's probably just your problem, really. <laughs> 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 but, but if, I thought so. But if you are in a house where there is an earthbound ghost and you're feeling angry, you're giving them energy enough to make themselves known to you. So they could move something or they could be a cold spot next to you. And by the way, I have come up with a scientific explanation of cold spots because that's something that paranormal people always say that is uh, felt whenever there's in the presence of a ghost. Let's hear it. I want to hear about that, and I want to hear about orbs, too. I want to know if orbs affect just ghosts or spirits. I'm curious what your thought is on that. Sure. Um, so the, the scientific explanation for cold spots, 
warm air is really fast moving molecules of air. Colder air moves at a much slower rate. So what happens is when you're in the presence of a ghost or even a spirit for that matter, and they want to get energy enough to, to make a noise or touch you or move something, what they do is they take the energy of motion of those molecules of air. And by doing that, they slow those molecules down. And that means the warm air becomes cold air or cooler air, if you will, in the spot where that energy or that entity is trying to manifest. So when I'm watching Ghost Adventures or any of those shows and they're like, oh, my God, the amphimeter, it's, it's like 10 degrees colder or whatever. There is a scientific reason for that. And they're, they're not just pulling the wool over our eyes. It's probably could, could be a, a ghost that's there, correct? That's right. Something's trying to manifest. Something's trying to appear there by using the energy of the motion of molecules of atmosphere. So we're going to talk about pets in a few minutes. And actually, you've been gracious enough to offer to one of my friends lost a pet. He's had a very tough year. And we're going to do that a five or 10 minute type reading on him and see if that pet comes through. But before we go there, a lot of our audience is from the UK and you've written a couple of your books on the UK. You want to give us a little tease about them? Sure. Well, the uh, there's one book that actually focuses on two trips that I took to England, and it's called Ghosts of England on a Medium's Vacation. And it's actually one of my favorite books because it's full of history. The reason we, we went to England twice on vacation is that my husband is kind of an amateur historian on the Tudors. He loves the Tudor period. Now, I don't know anything about the Tudors. So he planned these two vacations, and we went to almost every Tudor place you can imagine, castles, churches, burial sites, all kinds of things. And wherever we went, there was some dead person trying to talk to me. <laughs> so, um, and some of these places were much more haunted than others. As you can imagine, the Tower of London, which is actually, it was built as a castle and then used as a prison and, and other things. And there are a lot of people that are executed in there. That is really, really haunted. Um, Hampton Court Palace, which was Henry VIII's palace. That is also haunted. That has tons of ghosts in them. So, so those are two of the places. We also wound up staying at a uh, Tudor-era palace called Thornbury Castle. Now, that was owned by the Duke of Buckingham, whom, who was a, uh, a rival to Henry VIII for the throne of England. So, of course, Henry took his head off <laughs> and then took his castle. <laughs> We stayed in there. It's now a luxury bed and breakfast. Turns out our room was haunted by a gentleman who revealed himself to be named Rupert. And, uh, and he gave me all kinds of clues as to who he was and why he was there. And I figured them out when we got home. And there's a whole chapter in there about who this man is. He actually was in a battle uh, in, nearby from the castle. So can you say the title of that book again? Sure. It's called Ghosts of England on a Medium's Vacation. Now, I think your husband is, he has paranormal abilities too. Is that correct? He does. Um, yeah. And, and what's interesting is that he never had them until we went to England. Really? Oh, that's crazy. Wow. Yeah. We were in Westminster Abbey and he started uh, sensing a ghost in Westminster Abbey in one of, the, one of the areas where somebody, a king was buried and he smelled a rotted corpse. He smelled something that smelled like a rotted corpse. And he said, there is, a, there is a man standing right there. And I sensed a man at the same time. So his gift was smelling the smell of death. And he, yeah. he can have that because I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah. Um, You're a pet psychic. If you had that, you'd be smelling a bunch of stuff. I get it. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we have, three, we have three dogs. So I smell that stuff anyway. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I just got a rescue dog. I've always had dogs, and I just got a rescue dog, and it's like once in a while I have to smell that. So yeah, so interesting. So that, how old, if you don't mind, was he when this started for him in, in that trip in England? Oh, gosh. He, he, was, uh, he was about 49, 49 years old. Wow. So it can happen at any time. We can. I, I know Ruthie, I guess she always thought she had uh, the gift, but she always ignored it, and, and she had a whole corporate successful career, and then she kind of came out of the closet, she called it, a little later on in life. So that's fascinating. Did you write a book about the experiences? I Correct me if I'm wrong. I thought in a kind of a funny incident, your uh, husband's ex who may have who passed before you met him is friends with you in the afterlife. Am I saying that correctly? You are absolutely correct. It's called Kindred Spirits. And, and since, uh, since my husband Tom and I have been together, this spirit 
the spirit of Ed, who died in 1996, and I, I've never met him in life, he came along for the ride. So I always joke that there's three of us in this relationship. And, um, <laughs> and it, what's kind of funny about it, though, is that Ed has told me many things about his life with Tom that I would never know. That is that, that is just so unfair in many ways. I'm sure Tom has told you that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Bob, can you imagine that being, um, you know, being being married to somebody at, who is talking to your late late partner? It's like having my ex. I just got divorced. Having my ex wife meet a new girlfriend and tell her all my my failings. That would be awful. <laughs> I'm sure, but I if, if I recall. Ed seems like a very – he's a very good friend and a good spirit, so uh, he's, he's kind of uh, – he's not like a person to say nasty things probably about Tom, correct? No, not at all. No, and he's a really funny guy too. You know, the, one story I didn't put in there is that he uh, he stole all of my underwear <laughs> out of my closet, and it, and it wasn't Tom. Um, yeah. <laughs> He was a jokester, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Did it reappear yeah. somewhere later, or did he direct you to it? How did that How did that story end? Uh, yeah, I found it all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right, let's get into the pet stuff. I mean, uh, I, so you your first experience wasn't with an animal. I think it was with your grandfather when you were about 13. Your uh, psychic ability really bloomed when you're, you had a puppy, a were-mariner, I guess, that passed early and then came back. So you, do you mind giving us kind of very quickly your first experience with your grandfather and then you know, fast forward to your pet and how that really opened your psychic eye? Sure. I was never close to my grandfather before he passed. And I was a teenager. And one day I was home alone and, and I, he just materialized in front of me in full color and scared the living daylights out of me. And I ran out of the house. And stay there waiting for my parents. And uh, when I when I told my parents when they came home, my mother was not surprised, which made me raise my eyebrows. It turned out she had the ability to, but wow. she was afraid to use it. So fast forward many years, I had a couple of experiences in between. My aunt had come to me after she died, begging for forgiveness from my mother for doing things to my mother. I lived in a house that wound up being haunted by a Civil War soldier when I was in college. <laughs> and then in 2005, I had a puppy. Uh, I was given a puppy and I named him Buzz. I was given the puppy for my birthday. Now, Buzz came to me and he had pneumonia. And I spent the first two, three weeks together with him every single night, every day, nursing him back to health. We got very, very close. Unfortunately, when he was seven months old, his leash opened when I was walking him. He was killed by a car. But Buzz reawakened my abilities. Buzz, right from the get-go, Buzz became the world's best canine communicator from spirit. Did he come back to, cause were you feeling guilty and blaming yourself and he came back to console you? Or, or how, did, how did that first incident happen where Buzz came back to you? Yeah, I didn't even have time to feel guilty. I mean, I was still, I was in shock pretty much. So he, he sent me musical signs. He manipulated electricity in the house as soon as I came back to the house with his body. And then we went right to the vet with his body so they could prepare him and you know cremate him. One of the things he did was he popped the lid off a trash can behind the vet's office when myself and three of my friends who had come there to, uh, to meet me were standing there. There was nothing behind the trash can. There was nothing at all. It went four feet in the air, and I knew it was him. With all the stuff that was happening, you know, the, the electricity and all this different stuff, did you get an inkling right away, or did it take two or three of these things? Did you go, wait a minute, this, this could be Buzz? No, I knew it was him. I absolutely knew it was him right from the beginning. How did he communicate? Was it like telepathically? Was it just through feelings? Was it through words, symbols? It was mostly telepathic, and it, and it was a feeling also. It's like with anybody. If you're laying in bed, sometimes you feel like someone is there with you. Someone that passed maybe is there with you, maybe sitting next to you or watching over you. That's the kind of feeling it was. So one thing I learned about being a medium is that you really have to trust your feelings. I love to quote Star Wars and say, trust your feelings, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> but there really is something about that. So yeah, over the course of time, um, you know, Buzz really showed me all the different ways that pets will communicate. He led me to another Weimaraner that looked like him. And it was on the anniversary of his passing that he did that. So I learned that spirit, when spirit communicates with you, there's no such thing as a coincidence. 
Now, the pets that come over, are they ghosts or spirits? Are they ghosts that want to communicate? They're waiting for their masters? Or are they spirits that have passed over that want to communicate via love and uh, positive affection? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so they're, they're all spirits. I, I would say about 2% of pets would stay behind as an earthbound ghost. I've only run into one or two, actually. I've only run into two in all the years I've been doing this. One was a cat in a house where we did a paranormal investigation. And the other one was a dog in England, as a matter of fact, at the John Soane Museum. Uh, it was John Soane's dog that stayed behind. But for the most part, our pets cross over into the light. And, and the reason they do that is because our loved ones, our human loved ones, our relatives in spirit are on the other side and they are calling them over. When they go into the light, do they have a life review like humans do, or is their life so short and they're not as they don't do as horrible things like we do? They don't have to deal with. Yeah, that. they no, they don't have to deal with that <laughs> because pets are really unconditional love. Yeah, humans still haven't learned that. It's funny in my mind. I'm thinking Buzz is on the other side, and all these pets that wanted some type of vehicle to communicate found him, just like ghosts find you, and human ghosts find you and try to talk to you, right? So it's, 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 it's almost like he's, he's like a version of you on the other side, but for pets, it's kind of the feeling I get. Is that accurate? Do other animal spirits go to him? And then he says, hey, Rob, I got another one for you. <laughs> Sends him your way. <laughs> well, n no, they don't really have to seek him out. Um, they, can, um, they can seek people out by themselves. Uh, but, but Buzz has actually just really shown me how they will communicate with people on this side. So no, pets can, pets can actually do, the, do it themselves. And, and the thing is, is the love that binds them to the person, to their parent, their pet parent, it, it's like an invisible tether. So if you've lost a pet, wherever you go, if you move from the house in which you had the pet, your pet will always find you. Your pet in spirit will always find you, no matter where wow. you go. That's comforting. That's great. Now, can we do some – people have all these kind of perceptions, you know, about dogs versus cats. And so I'm, I'm curious, now that you communicate to a bunch of them, are cats more spiritual than dogs? I've heard, like, dogs are your protectors on Earth, but cats are the ones that are connected to the afterlife. Are dogs as spiritual as, as cats are that you, when you communicate to these, these beings? Sure. They're equally as, as spiritual. Every, everyone um, – every animal basically has the same – ability to cross over and become a spirit. Dogs are, are not any different than cats. As a matter of fact, we all maintain our personalities when we cross over. So in my Pets in the Afterlife book, what I do is I cite a couple of scientific studies because I'm a scientist. And one of them is behavioral study and intel, a study of intelligence. So D Dr. Stanley Corrin analyzed dogs because he has dogs. And he found out that dogs and cats have the intelligence of a three- to five-year-old human child. Dogs seem to be a little more intelligent than cats. Cats are more instinctive. So I would say cats have like the intelligence of a three-year-old child, and dogs have the intelligence up to a five-year-old child. If you have a cat, you know it's harder to train a cat than it is to train a dog. Yeah, that's why I've had mostly dogs. Mm -hmm. There are some pretty interesting stories that you've had, some cases that you've had with clients and with mm -hmm. pets. Would you mind sharing a couple of those? Sure. One case in particular stands out, and that is um, that is about a woman named Elizabeth who, who wrote me after reading my first Pets in the Afterlife book. She lost her puppy. She said that uh, she was out, and her, her puppy, who was a Cocker Spaniel named Clancy, started getting ill when she was out for a couple of hours and her husband called her and said that the dog was very sick suddenly. She couldn't understand why because the dog was perfectly healthy before she left. So she came home and the dog was very lethargic. She wound up calling the emergency vet. The vet said either take her in immediately, take Clancy in rather immediately, or you can watch Clancy for a couple of hours and then maybe take him in. So she opted to do the latter. She watched the dog. She checked on the dog in two hours and the dog had passed away. And she was totally beside herself. She felt terrible. She felt guilty. She didn't know what happened. Uh, the dog was perfectly healthy like four or five hours before. She wanted to know how in the world her dog had possibly passed away. And she felt guilty. So she wrote me. And she sent me a picture of Clancy, which is what I need in order to get in touch with them, the dog's name, and then her questions. So while I was sitting here at the computer, I was able to get in touch with Clancy. And I started to get a severe pains in my stomach. 
And then Clancy showed me that he was eating plants. So that told me right there that his passing was a result of eating some kind of poisonous plant that killed him. So I sent her a list from the SPCA of all the toxic plants, you know, house plants that people have. And she wrote me back probably within like 20 minutes. And she was able to pinpoint several of those plants on that list. Wow. And she realized that that is in fact what happened to Clancy. She said because he would go out in the backyard and he would actually eat plants in the backyard. Yeah. So she finally understood what was what had happened. And Clancy assured me that it is not her fault. He knew that sometimes he would get an upset stomach when he was eating those plants, but he still continued to do it. So it was his responsibility. His passing was his responsibility. I mean, it didn't take the tragedy away, of course, but it did, you know, make her feel less guilty about what had happened. You have three books, right, on, on this topic. Do you mind telling us what the difference is between the three books? Are they just more stories that you've learned or, or is there a different angle on book one versus book two and the third one that you're working on? Sure. Uh, there is somewhat of a difference in, in them. So the first book has uh, cites the scientific studies. One is a, actually also an emotional um, a study that actually proves that dogs have the same emotions as humans by doing a, a study, an MRI study of the caudate of the brain. And that was done by an Emory University professor. And the first book also has chapters by three different mediums, including Ruthie, Ruthie Larkin, and other stories that Buzz has shared with me and some stories from others. Pets in the Afterlife 2 is a compilation of readings that I have given and uh, how pets have communicated with, with their own parents. And also, both of these books outline all the different ways that pets communicate. The third book that I'm working on, Pets in the Afterlife 3, that should be out in January 2021, there's a grief component to this. A good friend of mine is a medical psychologist, and he helped write a chapter on how to cope with the grief, not only to recognize the signs from pets, but how to cope with the grief. And this particular book, Pets in the Afterlife 3, will focus only exclusively on messages from dogs. I am writing a Pets in the Afterlife 4 that will focus exclusively on cats, but that's not going to come out for a couple of years. <laughs> so they all have a different angle. Wow. And give us another story or two, if you don't mind, out of these books. Sure. There was a, a dog named Buddy that uh, he gave me the most incredibly detailed messages that, that were beyond my belief, really. This couple that had come to one of my, my lectures about how pets communicate from the other side, and they sat in the back of the room and they, they cried through the entire thing. And then at the end, they came up to me and they couldn't even speak to me because they had lost their dog, Buddy. So I handed them my card and I said, I understand you have, you've suffered a great loss. Please just email me the photograph of your dog. Tell me who you are and I'll be happy to try and get some messages. So they did. This dog came through to me with a number of amazing things. First of all, he showed me what looked like pine trees that were hundreds of feet high. And he said, this is my favorite place. And he showed me a gravel path. And he said, this is my favorite place that I, I would walk. He said, my grandmother, my grandmother's name is Elsie, but it's spelled E-L-K-E. And I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. So I'm sitting here typing this up as this, as this dog is communicating with me. And I said, he says that his grandmother's name is E-L-K-E, but it's pronounced Elsie. And I said, I, you know, I, I have no idea what this means. I said, you're probably not going to understand this. And I said, I, there's something about a gravel path, the tallest pine trees I've ever seen. And the other thing he said was he was appreciative of you taking him for ice cream. I'm lactose intolerant, by the way, so I don't ever have ice cream in the house. <laughs> so I would never think of that. You know, I'd never think of that on my own. So anyway, long story short, the couple wrote back and they said, we did take our dog Buddy through the Wendy's drive through on his last day for ice cream because that was his favorite thing to, to eat. And then we took him to the dog park so he could watch other dogs. They included a couple of pictures and one was a picture of a giant forested area. And they said, this is Buddy's favorite place to go. The gentleman said, my mother-in-law is German, and we would take him to Germany. And we would take him through the Third Garten Forest, which has the highest pine trees in the world. And he said, furthermore, my 
<laughs> my wife's mother is named Elsie, spelled E L K E. Wow. Oh. <laughs> and there's a picture in Pets in the Afterlife 2 of the forest and Elsie <laughs> and the path that he, he walked and all that. It's just chilling yeah. to me yeah. that a dog can convey this kind of detail. Now, does this second book have chapters written by mediums like the first one does, or is are, are books two and three you just putting your experiences and your your findings out there? Yeah, books two and three are just me, just just me, or or people who have offered stories of how their pets have communicated. And so the bottom line is here that you don't need to be a medium to see how your pets communicate. I teach people in these books all the different ways that pets communicate, so they don't need to pay a medium. They can actually read about how they communicate and just look for signs. So are there exercises that they need to do or is it just you just tell them the, the signs in the books that, is, that uh, what to look for? There's, there's nothing that they need to – like remote viewing, they don't need to practice things in an envelope or anything. It's just they need to look for signs and pay attention to how their animal is trying to communicate to them. That is exactly what they need to do. They just need to – once they read about it, they'll, they'll get an idea about different, different ways that pets communicate and then uh, keep an eye out. So some of the ways, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of uh, quick ways that pets will communicate. They will lead you to another pet that looks like them. You may hear someone speak their name. Of course, it's easier if you name your, if you name your dog Jimmy, you might hear somebody say Jimmy. But uh, honestly, <laughs> um, you, it doesn't matter what you name your pet. You may hear that name. Your dog or cat will lead you to that place at that very moment so you can hear that name. It doesn't matter where you travel. Your pet can find you. Uh, I was on vacation in Puerto Rico in 2009 when we had to decide which street to take. I was I felt like I was pushed, being pushed or nudged down one particular street, got down to the end of the street. There was a man walking dogs. One was a Weimaraner that looked like Buzz. And I suddenly heard Buzz in my head. And he said, Dad, you know what today is. Uh, and it was the fourth anniversary of his passing. Yeah. So pets will lead you to an animal that looks like them. And with the help of human spirits on the other side, they can, they can manipulate coins. They can use man, manipulate things in nature like squirrels or birds or uh, dragonflies, butterflies. But they have to behave oddly. It's not just if you see a butterfly, that's a spirit. That's not how it works. If they behave oddly, if it's related to their birthday, anniversary, or holiday, those are the times to look for signs from spirit. Does numerology play into it ever, or like you know, you see like the number eleven, eleven, or you see a three, or you see something? Is it has that ever play in, or is it more just symbolic other things that are more physical world things? No, sure, numerology can can also play into it. And here's a quirky story that's actually going to be pets in the afterlife three. So I'll give you kind of a preview. This one gentleman had written me, and his black lab had passed away, and he was very distraught, and he wanted to get he wanted to know if they were okay, and so his black lab told me the number 512. And I said to him, you know, that could be a time of his passing maybe or his birth. That could be a month and a day. I don't know what it means. I said, but he's very adamant about telling you 512 to prove that it's him. And the gentleman's like, I have no idea what that means. And I said, well, you know, think about it. And then, you know, maybe over the course of a couple months, you'll figure it out. Well, six months later, he wrote me back and he said, you may not remember me, but, and he said, long story short, I'm a doctor. And he said, I was seeing a patient in my, uh, in my practice and he suffered from a collapsed lung. And he said, when I went to write the diagnosis, it was code 512. And he said, my dog passed from collapsed lungs. Only the oh, dog wow. of a physician would know that code. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, numbers are uh, important. Yeah, that is amazing. <laughs> hey, everybody. This is your paranormal podcast pal, Bob Heskey. You know, every night I like to listen to videos on YouTube. But lately, with COVID, civil unrest, market volatility, politics, conspiracy theories, I just want to tune out. <laughs> That's why I like Audible. What's Audible, you say? Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audio books, including some great horror and paranormal titles like A Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay, 
If It Bleeds by Stephen King, and The Boatman's Daughter by Andy Davidson. This place is cursed. Each month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible Originals from a monthly selection. Access to daily news digests, if you actually want to hear the news, as well as guided meditation programs. Hey, we all need a little zen now and again. And Audible is oh so easy. You can download titles and listen offline, anytime, anywhere, on any device. The app is free and can be installed in your smartphone or tablet. You can even listen across devices without losing your spot. How cool is that? If you can't decide what to listen to, no problem. You can keep your credits for up to a year and binge on your favorite series later on. So, here's the rub. The Afraid of Nothing podcast is stoked to partner with the audio bookworms at Audible to offer you a free 30-day trial membership. Just follow the link in the show notes, audibletrial.com forward slash AON Podcast. Puedes repetir eso, por favor. That's audibletrial.com forward slash AON, all caps, podcast, lowercase. Full disclosure, I get a commission for everyone who signs up using that URL. But you get to try it for 30 days without a commitment. Using our custom URL doesn't cost you a penny and helps out the show if you do sign up. Nothing scary about that. So escape reality and pick up a book an audio book, and listen to what's out there. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash AON podcast after listening to the show. Welcome back. As I teased earlier in the program, I did ask Rob to connect with one of my friends, one of my best friends, Dan Miller, who went to school with me at Indiana University. We were fraternity brothers. We've stayed pretty much best friends since then. And Dan lost a dog, Charlie, in the past year. And so Dan sent Rob a picture and his name. Rob did a download, had a conversation with Dan, and this is the results. Dan called me and gave me a recap. Hey, Dan Miller, thank you for calling in. You just talked to Rob Guttrow, the pet medium. How'd it go? Uh, well, it was, it was good, Bob. I was uh, very surprised and kind of uh, enlightened, I think, is the best way to put it, uh, from some of the things he said. It just, by sending him a picture and Charlie's name, uh, I really wasn't sure what to expect. You know, maybe a lot of generic stuff that could apply to anything. And to a certain extent, that was true, only just by the way dogs behave. But he nailed down a couple of things that uh, I, it's hard to explain who would have known him, except for me and the dog. One of the, you know, kind of the basic questions I asked was, uh, like, if, you know, what was her favorite toy? And he mentioned a duck that she would carry around the house and, and that it was a squeaky toy. And, and I immediately thought, well, I do remember a pig that was a squeaky toy that we played with constantly and another big kind of stuffed duck that she carried and she would fetch and, and he mentioned a couple of other ones but but he said that and then I I tied those two together well after the conversation as I was driving I had to take a picture of what's actually been on my dashboard for gosh I don't know six months or so it's a smaller duck that she used to carry and because that's what I kind of thought of with her is, is what I want to keep around to remind me of her and I checked, and sure enough, that little duck also had a squeaker device. Wow. And, <laughs> and part of his comment was the, the duck that used to squeak. And I, it didn't really hit me until it all came over me. Like, how, how would he know that? And, yeah. and there it was. Or it's been there for me. And, and it's just a constant reminder of her and the bond we shared. To look at what he said... It was far from generic. It was very specific, and and it really made me feel good about the whole day and really every day that I've seen that duck and noticed it or seen it and forgotten that it was there. You know, that's, so, it, it shows you picked the right toy. Uh, what about in terms of you had a question, I think, on when she was passing. Any information on that? Yeah, and that's kind of the other thing that really was a very specific thing. 
she was a big dog, 100 pounds, a master bloodhound mix, and very loyal and always around. And as age, you know, came upon her, she kind of had a hard time getting around. And her belly started hanging low. Um, we put her to the vet for another reason, and the vet said, hey, this is really going on with your dog. It has uh, Cushing's disease, which is where the abdomen kind of loses its muscular tension and starts to disintegrate. And sometimes some of their internal organs start hanging low and they're a lot more sensitive and things like that. Well, in the end, he mentioned that she told him she had pains in her stomach. And uh, obviously that was it. And that's why she passed from ultimately. But in the last few days and week or so, he had mentioned that she communicated to him that she had a pain in her right leg and her hip. And I'm kind of breaking up a little because that's the last week or so. She couldn't walk and her right leg started swelling up. Wow. And we got anti-inflammatory medication from the vet to try and make it subside so we could get her in and do some other treatment. And then, you know, in the end, the end just came quicker than what we thought. But there's nobody else that knew that except for my ex-wife. And for that to be something that she communicated, she knew that there wasn't anything that was that was taking her away from us that we hadn't tried to correct. She, she said she knew that it was her time, it wasn't my fault, that kind of thing. Uh, but to zero in on her discomfort for the last few days without knowing anything, anything about it, I mean, it really just caused me to smile and start crying and, and almost like I was able to give her a hug and pet her and say, I'll see you soon or I'll see you someday, you know? So anyway, that was really uh, just a, a very great, a, a great phone call. It's a great feeling and I've been kind of swimming around in it all day and I will for, for several days, I'm sure. And that was it. An amazing job, really. Beyond those things that Dan pointed out after we talked, he mentioned one other thing that really resonated with him was that Rob knew that he had adopted Charlie right around age one. And actually, Dan had adopted Charlie at age 11, 11 months. So uh, he was shocked, too, that Rob would know that he didn't get the dog as a puppy or from the beginning. There were other things as well. It's just an amazing job and connection, and it really was an affirmation that made Dan feel well and just kind of a tribute to Rob's capabilities. So there, testimonial, man. He's good. Back to the show. So what about, I think we had talked also before, the difference between wild animals versus domesticated animals. Let's talk about, because there is a difference in who can communicate or not. So I want to just share that. Sure. So the reason that domesticated animals can communicate with us is because they live with us. They live with us. They hear our language. They learn our habits. They can learn to read our emotions. They learn our routine and our schedule and so forth. Wild animals don't have that association with people. So wild animals never learn our language. That's why I can't really communicate with wild animals. I can only communicate with animals that are domesticated that have been around us. So I can't talk to a polar bear. <laughs> <You know? laughs> or Bigfoot. My last episode, there was a remote viewing uh, expert uh, that was on that talked about how she was given targets and one of them was Bigfoot, <laughs> blind target. And she's like, oh, my God, I'm actually in Bigfoot's head, <laughs> which was incredible in its own right. And, and here's a story, too, which might interest you. You know the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats? Have you ever seen that with George Clooney and Paranormal? It's about paranormal spies. I, I've heard of it. Okay. It's named after that they theoretically could. One of the things they do is they, they will stare at a goat, give it a heart attack, and the goat dies. Okay. But the story behind that that goes that they don't tell you is that the person that did that felt the heart attack and felt the trauma and felt after that incident happened just was severely affected by doing that to the goat. So it wasn't like simply making a goat die, ha, ha, I have the strength. It was kind of like they felt it and they were there and they kind of, as an empath, you know, it, it really affected them. So they had to do a, a, a tremendous amount of cleansing uh, after that experience. Mm -hmm. Has there been anything with pets and experiencing passing, how they passed or anything like that? Or Sure. Uh, one of the ways that uh, pets communicate with me and, and prove their identity is actually by sharing pain of death. So I have 
been able to pinpoint exactly how a pet had passed, whether it, their heart gave out, kidney failure, um, tumors, uh, all kinds of things. Hit by a car or something like that? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And what's interesting is that, you know, I when I'm channeling these pets, I, I'm sitting at my desk in front of the computer and then suddenly I get these pains in different parts of my body. So I know if I get a pain in my right shoulder, it's their front right leg. And that that's what I convey. I just got an email from some somebody, I think he was in India, and he said he wanted to know how his dog is and if I could really get in touch with his dog. And I said, well, your dog is telling me that on his right hip, he always walked with kind of a, a limp and there's really severe pain there. And he said, oh my God, when my dog was a puppy, there was um, there was an accident and his right hip was injured. So they make me feel wow. the pain. Yeah. How do you cleanse yourself? After? And I, I, I do want to spend just a couple minutes on the human ghost stories, too, as, as well, if you don't mind. Uh, but how do you cleanse yourself, whether it's, you know, your investigations in haunted houses or with uh, feeling an empath feeling of how a pet dies like that? How do you kind of cleanse that off of yourself? Well, there's a number of ways that we, we do that. Um, so I belong to Inspired Ghost Tracking of Maryland. And one of the things that we do is we, before we go in an investigation, we all join hands and we offer kind of a prayer, if you will, of protection. It's not a religious thing. It's just a general concentration of protection. So when we come out of an investigation, one of the ways we cleanse ourselves is by picturing white energy, like white light around us that comes from the top and then just goes down and pushes all of the negative energy off into the earth, into the ground. Sometimes people can, we, we will uh, like touch a tree and we'll just imagine that the negative energy is channeling out, out of us into the tree and back into the earth. Sometimes we'll eat chocolate. <laughs> That seems like the best approach. Yeah, that's the one that I like. Because <laughs> chocolate raises the, I think, the endorphins in your in your body um, and makes you feel good. Wow. How did you stumble across that? Did you know it? Did someone tell you that? Or did you just figure that out yourself? Or? Uh, Margaret Ehrlich, the founder of Inspired Ghost Tracking, is the one that, that shared that. And, you know, it, to me, it works. I can't get enough chocolate after <laughs> <for> <laughs> So is there is it dark chocolate versus uh, you know white chocolate or regular chocolate? Is there a particular brand that's more potent, or does any type of chocolate? Work? Anything that makes you feel good. Wow, that, that's great. So you are part of a paranormal group, and I think you've just written you, one of your you've either just written or you have a, a a book already out about those experiences. Do you want to tell us a, a little bit about that book? Sure. So as a paranormal investigator, I am a member of Inspired Ghost Tracking of Maryland. Um, I'm one of the uh, the mediums, and actually my husband is uh, another one. My latest book is called Case Files of Inspired Ghost Tracking, and it contains quite a number of cases that we have, have gone on. And what we do is we go into homes, private homes that contact us, families contact us when they think they have paranormal problems. And we'll go in and investigate because we like to do two things. One, we like to bring peace to the home and the family. Two, we like to cross ghosts over because ghosts do not belong earthbound. They need to cross over and become spirits. So in this book, there are a number of things. And, you know, when you go into somebody's house, you never know what to expect. And every case is totally different. In one particular case that's, that's in this book, I call it the double murder ghost investigation. That was probably the most incredible case that we've been on. And that wound up, myself and another medium, uh, wound up sensing two women that were brutally murdered in this home that stayed behind as earthbound ghosts. And uh, they shared with us the pain of death. They were actually uh, tortured by this man who was on a drug-induced uh, frenzy that was a renter of one of the – in the basement. How long ago was this? Was this like – 1980s uh... it was about 15 years ago 20 years ago and the the man is still in he's in uh, western maryland in prison doing double life a double life sentence they caught him but the the two women that were murdered insisted on staying in that home as earthbound ghosts because they wanted to protect any family that moved into that home from the murderer even though we told them that the murderer was caught 
And what's interesting is that we, we went in there, the, the other medium and I went in there not knowing anything about the house or anything about what happened or nothing because that's how we work. The mediums go in and we don't know anything. We are actually just given the address one hour before we're supposed to be there. As it turns out, all of the things that we felt and sensed were uh, confirmed by the police report. So is this almost like the dead files where you, like you guys go in, you do the walkthrough, and then there's someone that does the research on the, on the back end, and then you reconcile it after you, you share your impressions? Or That's exactly how it works, yes. <laughs> I mentioned this on a prior podcast. The thing about the dead files, are you familiar with that show? I am. It always blows my mind that they have not just one ghost, but they have like one ghost, and then like a, you know, the land with a, you know, from turmoil with the Indians, and then there's a poltergeist, and then there's some shadow. Fa- there's like four or five things on every house recently on that show, which is – I enjoy it, but it's like so many things thrown into it. I, I would imagine most of your investigations, is it pretty much standard one ghost? Or, in fact, you run into cases where there's many things going on that you have to deal with. Uh, it varies. There was one case where we ran into the spirit of a dog, the spirit of a grandmother, and a burned ghost, a ghost who died in a, uh, a fiery car accident. Then we went to – we investigated a Maryland mansion, and there were about six or seven ghosts from all different time periods there. Wow. Do you tend to move them all, or do you – what's your success rate? Do some just not go, and you just do the best you can, or – yeah, you know, it depends on their personality. So, some of them really insist on staying. It's like being alive with people. You can't help people that don't want help, right? <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. You said the personality doesn't change. No. Uh, on a personal note, in my point in life, I've lost my mother like five or six years ago, and that impacted me to do several things, actually. Uh, and I think she even pushed me to do some things like make a movie. And then it's affected other things in my life, which I probably wouldn't have done. Have you been affected uh, with uh, – have, you, have your parents or any, any loved ones passed and then that they, you are in communications with since you uh, – now with your, your medium capabilities? Sure. Uh, both my dad and my mom have passed. Um, my dad actually was uh, – like Buzz, was inspirational in having me write my first book, Ghosts and Spirits. And in that particular book, my dad uh, – there's a story of how my dad helped me convince my mother and my brothers that he was at his own wake and his oh. own funeral. And your mom is psychic, right? She does have those abilities and she just didn't connect with that and, and so it came through you? Yeah. My, my mom was um, – she was um, a medium and she was also psychic, but she was afraid to use it. So what's kind of funny is that when she realized that I had this gift – she would always call me up and say, what dead people have you talked to? And, <laughs> she, uh, <laughs> and, but she wouldn't want to talk to any of herself. Yeah. My mother is always around. It, one thing that's interesting for the, for the listeners is that we all maintain our personalities when we pass. So when my dad passed in 2008, I heard from him a lot. When my mom passed in 2013, five years later, I don't hear from my dad anymore. Not very much. Because in life, my dad was quiet and he let my mother do all the talking. Now that's oh, happening that on the is, other side. That is that is great. Um, excellent. And so you've had – and how frequently do you talk to your mother? Does she just c- c- come around during unexpected times or are there certain points when you're down that she comes along or does it uh, just – you never know? Um, well, I have to tell you that my husband has a way of channeling my mother, which is kind of unnerving. <laughs> oh, that's his, that's uh, the, all right, carpe diem, right, or karma, or something, right? It's just uh, he, he has a way to get back. That's great. It, yeah, he'll say things that my mother used to say, and he wouldn't know that. You know, she oh, used to say things. Awesome. <laughs> but you know, but I ha- I've got one on him too because Ed, his late partner Ed, tells me things that you know. Yeah, are, yeah. Are him, yeah. Okay, so. that's good. You have something on each other. That that gets, I think that's fair. You know? We do from the spirit world. We do. <laughs> yeah. Have have you two gotten even closer now that he has? I mean, now that he has these abilities, can you communicate with each other? Does he go with you on some of these investigations, or does he just kind of say, "All right, I have it. That's enough. I'm not one of." Um, no, he actually does go on the investigations, uh, and uh, you know, we compare notes, and and often we will we will get the same thing, it, which is great because when you have more than one medium, you act as a a confirmation to each other. And and Ruthie and I did that when we went to Ford's Theater, and we ran into the the ghost of John Wilkes Booth in the very same spot. And that's in one of your books. Which book is that in? That is in Lessons Learned from Talking to the Dead. Okay. So we're going to let the listeners 
check out that book and find out for themselves rather than do it here. So, Rob, thank you so much for your time today. I, I'd like to close by, you know, once again, plugging your website and uh, where they can get your books and what the next one that you're working on. Sure. The, the website is Rob Gutro, G-U-T-R-O, or PetSpirits.com. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, although I do my best to keep up with it. Um, everything's on Amazon, and it's in paperback and ebook, and it's all really affordable, under $10. And my, my next book is Pets in the Afterlife 3, which I am going to hopefully publish January 2021. And then I've got seven other books lined up after that. I was going to ask you that. What other? I had, I had interviewed another author, a prolific writer and researcher, a couple episodes ago, and they always have like four or five in the coffers that they're kind of working on or outlining in various degrees. So is that the same with you? You have like six or seven that you're in various degrees of fleshing out and outlining and doing research on? Yeah, and actually some of them are actually already written. They just need to be edited, like uh, Ghosts of Scotland and Ireland on a Medium's Vacation. <laughs> wow, I, I went there. and the international audience. People love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's there's always something. You know, what's interesting is when you, when you're a medium uh, and you go on vacation, you get double the uh, entertainment, if you will. <laughs> Obviously, you're not traveling lately. Do you do you want people to connect with you and say, "Hey, here's an interesting story for your next book"? Sure, I love getting emails from from people uh, who want to share their experiences. Or if they have questions, I, I love answering questions. I write a blog every uh, every week, and usually I actually have something every other day on the blog. Questions about people, about pets, about ghosts, earthbound ghosts, or spirits who have crossed over. If you have a question, if you lost a pet, I recommend that you read one of the Pets in the Afterlife books to kind of get an idea of how your pets communicate with you. It'll bring you comfort too, and then you, you you know you're always welcome to send me a picture of your pet and your pet's name and uh, any questions. You know I'm always willing to help people out because I you know I've lost I've lost a couple of, of dogs myself, and these dogs are like my children. You, you know you never get over it. You never get over it. You never get over the loss, but you you can understand that they are still with you on the other side, and they show up from time to time. And do you think when you pass at some point in the future, when you cross over, will they be waiting for you, or will you just see them at some point on your uh, on your tr- journey into the other side? No, they they absolutely will be waiting. Uh, actually, when my dad passed away in the cemetery, when uh, they but they were doing the last services there. Uh, I saw the light open in the cemetery, which was weird because nobody else saw it. And in the light were my dad's parents and my mother's parents and our family dogs, our two family dogs and my dog Buzz. They'll be there. That's a great inspirational way to end it with the way things are going on in the world. That gives us hope. So Rob, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And, you know, look forward to your next book. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been a it's been a pleasure talking with you, and I I, I look forward to uh, to talking with you again. You've been listening to the Afraid of Nothing podcast. Please subscribe and like us on Facebook. Until next time, stay scared. Hey, you're still here? Great. Then why not listen to another episode? Visit afraidofnothingpodcast.com to peruse all the shows. That's afraidofnothingpodcast.com. And while you're there, click the coffee cup icon to buy me a coffee and leave a review. I'll give you a shout-out in an upcoming episode. And the world will know how swell you are.